Good morning, and welcome to another installment of our virtual seminar, Grove. It's the new year, and we are so glad that you've joined us here. We want to thank our sponsors, Cedar City, Brianhead, and Tourism Bureau to, for making this possible. And I'm actually really, really excited about it. Not only the topic, but these personalities, you're going to love them. Who do we have here, Jeff, this morning? What are we going to learn about and talk about today? Hey, we've got um, two special guests from across the country. Uh, we're going to talk about wardrobe and what goes on backstage while the audience is sitting out enjoying the performance. Um, Dr. Sarah McCarroll is visiting us from uh, Statesboro, Georgia. Uh, she teaches at Statesboro College there, and she's had a long career at the festival. She uh, 14 seasons over the period of 17 years. She worked at the festival in a variety of roles, and. Um, uh, she started here when she was a student, uh, an MFA student at uh, the University of Alabama, Roll Tide. And, um, and uh, so she's gonna talk about her insights as to what goes on backstage uh, during the course of the show. We've also got Levi Haberson, and Levi Haberson uh, was a student at the University of Wisconsin in Milwaukee when he first came to the festival. He was a student of mine when I taught there. And um, Levi has been with us for four or five seasons as assistant and a costume shop assistant and wardrobe supervisor. And he now teaches at Southwest Tech in the fashion and design program in Las Vegas. He's worked at uh, Cirque du Soleil and for Chris Angel in Las Vegas. And um, we're so happy to have both of you here from, uh, from your locations across the country. Yay, we're happy to be here. Good. Hi there. So, so we're going to talk about wardrobe and give people some insight into what goes on backstage. There might be a few actors or a few technicians watching, and they already know some of our secrets. But for those who don't, um, maybe one of you, Sarah, could you describe like kind of the standard work day for wardrobe? What happens? What, what goes on? Sure. So um, the real high watermark for wardrobe is during the tech process. Um, during the tech process, you're spending your days in the costume shop and then your evenings in the theater. Um, once shows get up, you're spending, if you have an afternoon show, your afternoon and then your evenings in the theater. Um, and the, the wardrobe process really starts at least an hour before curtain. And depending on the show, it can be significantly before that hour if it has to be with uh, making sure all of the costumes are in the dressing rooms, making sure that costumes have been steamed and ironed as needed so that they look the way they did on the first show every night. Uh, you do any repairs, particularly small minor repairs that um, might not have to go to the shop, but I've done emergency zipper replacements, you know, 10 minutes before curtain. Um, you, once the show goes up, um, you've got actors all dressed, everybody's got their wigs and their makeup, you place people into their dresses. Um, once, you, once the show goes up, you're making sure that everything runs smoothly. You really want um, to offload some of the, the, the burden of mental work from the actors. So you're helping with quick changes, you're making sure that costume pieces are available and easily accessible for actors when they need them. Um, you're also um, serving a sort of, um, what, pastoral function almost. You're there to help actors get through a night physically and emotionally. And if that means, um, I had an actor whose chapstick I carried around in my apron pocket all summer. And fine, yes, I will always have your chapstick when you want it because it helps you get through your night. Um, once uh, a, a show comes down at the end of the evening, you make sure people get undressed. You make sure the costumes are all neatly hung. We spend a lot of time with bottles of Febreze in our hands um, because even the best of actors can be stinky sometimes. Um, and then you do laundry. We really work very hard um, at the festival and in most professional theaters to try and ensure that the layer closest to the skin can be laundered, it, whether that's in the machine or in the cases of particularly some women's undergarments hand washed so that the, the energy that actors are pouring into their costumes can get gently removed um, at the end of the night. Uh, and once you've got stuff in the dryer or hung up to, to hang dry, you get to go home, but that's usually about an hour, hour and a half after everybody else leaves the theater. So um, wardrobe nights can be long, but they're also a lot of fun. Levi, can you talk about um, back about what goes on backstage during the course of the show, fast changes specifically? 
Oh, quick changes. So during the course of the show, um, the wardrobe team works to facilitate any changes that need to happen. So depending on how independent the actor is, how much help they need, um, you're there to help them get in and out of their clothes as quickly as possible. Um, so for some performers and some shows, that means just like we lay out the clothes on a chair and they change themselves and you just kind of, you're there to supervise and make sure nothing goes wrong. Um, and then some performers, because the changes are like literally so fast. How fast is the fastest change that you know that you've done? Oof. Um, I think with Tasso Feldman and Amadeus, we did the whole costume change, including his tights in 30 seconds. And there were five of us on that change. Mine's about yeah. the same. I yeah. first saw Dr. Faustus changing hosiery, hair and makeup, and rigging him for pyro in 30 seconds during Dr. Faustus. And again, yeah, there were five of us on that change. Yeah, and so depending on what needs to happen, you um, set up the change and everyone may just have one piece of clothing and you kind of um, Henry Ford, you know, assembly line it and literally someone's pulling up the tights and someone's putting on the jacket and someone's adjusting the wig at the same time. There might even be someone there that's just handing off a water bottle because you need those hands. Um, so that's kind of what we do. And then of course, Every now and then we jump in and help with other things. Um, sometimes we do cues and, you know, other stuff that there might just not be enough people around for. And it's like the wardrobe team is here and we are here to help and facilitate and make sure that the show runs perfectly every night. We um, choreograph those fast changes during dress rehearsal, even before dress mm -hmm. rehearsal, so that that everybody knows how how to play the part, how to, how mm -hmm. to do the role. And uh, sometimes we choreograph things and then do it in slow motion, improve it, watch it and improve mm -hmm. it and re-rig costumes maybe to have a zipper or an, uh, instead of a snap. We, we hardly ever use Velcro uh, backstage because it's noisy and snaggy, but, uh, but we might re-rig things to improve it and, uh, and keep getting things faster and faster. Um, and if you want to talk about the choreography process? Sorry. Um, for me, that that um, routine is actually one of the real satisfactions of wardrobe. I get a great deal of um, uh, personal satisfaction out of uh, the smoothness of the routine, making sure things go the same way every night. It gives actors a great deal of security. It feeds my little OCD twitches. Um, and, um, you know, uh, it's, it's our own little theatrical performance, right? Wardrobe people tend to sort of be okay with being in black and unseen, but when we rehearse these costume changes, we're working to get our own performance at our job better, just the way the actors do during their rehearsal process. Um, and sometimes they blow up in your faces, um, and sometimes even changes you've gotten right for weeks blow up in your face because something happens. Um, and there's also a satisfaction in fixing problems, right? One of the skills that people absolutely have to have is the ability to think on their feet and to make good decisions quickly. Um, uh, and so that process of rehearsing outside of the pressure environment of is one of the things that preps you for dealing with it when something goes wrong because you're really secure in every step so you know where you have to get even if something gets off the rails a little bit yeah absolutely yeah can you talk about the relationship you have with the performers Sarah yeah um some of the actors I've dressed over the years remain my greatest friends and some of my most important mentors um uh I, I don't know how Levi feels about this. I'm really good at dressing uh, older actors. Uh, uh, I usually have a lot to talk to them about in terms of how the text works, um, and they seem to like that interaction. Um, you know, the job of, of someone working wardrobe is to take some of the actually cognitively impossible task we're asking, asking actors to do, where they remember lines and walking, and they have to be in the moment and react emotionally to what's going on on stage we're offloading the burden of having to remember what costume you put on next. Um, actors respond to that if you do it well, if you become a support for them. Um, these become very intimate relationships. One of my favorite pictures I have um, of myself in a theater is standing uh, in the auditorium dressing rooms during a matinee performance of The Taming of the Shrew, and I was um, 
fixing, uh, closing the skirt on Melinda Funstein's dress. Um, and so we're look, I'm looking over her shoulder. We're both looking at each other in the mirror. And there's, you know, there's a, a deep affection there um, because you get through a process together. Actors have a lot to do and having someone that they can rely on really matters. Those friendships become very deep over time. Yeah, and there's a, there's a certain closeness too that automatically develops because these people are down to their skivvies in front of us, right? So like there's a very, very intense emotional bond that forms a, tr a level of trust when you're with someone in their most vulnerable state every day. Um, and like Sarah said, they end up being like your best friends and they trust you with their life and they trust you to stay calm when something goes wrong. And even if something's not wrong with the costumes, we end up hearing a lot of the venting that happens when the performers are stressed about their performance, another performer's performance, maybe something technical didn't happen right in the show. And we provide a lot of that like mental support backstage and just like kind of a, a shoulder to cry on for the performers when they need it. Um, and you do end up incredibly close to a lot of them. Um, I'm, I'm still close to so many of the performers that we've worked with. Um, Sarah likes dressing older performers. Um, I like kind of having that middle ground. I like having a couple equity ones. Um, Larry Bull is one of my favorite people to dress because he's literally the kindest, most professional person I've ever worked with. But I also love dressing the student performers um, and the young professionals that are in the green show um, or in the chorus of the musicals because they bring this like youth and energy. And for me, they're closer to my age. So I have a little bit more to relate to them with. Um, but that's really fun because you end up getting this huge diversity and seeing how performers grow and develop over time and how that impacts you professionally as well. Right. Yeah, I have no business dressing a chorus dressing room anymore because in my world, in my mid forties, they're now my students, right? And in the context of professional theater, they're not my students. Um, and I have a hard time breaking myself out of that pattern. So I'm bet like that energy is best left to others and I can go be in, in dressing rooms. Um, and you know, I think one of the, the important things to learn about your relationship with actors, if you're gonna work wardrobe, particularly long-term is very rarely is anything that happens in the context of the dressing room about you. Um, mm -hmm that it's not just a space that's a space of trust because yes, we, we you know, you see people in their underwear. Um, it's also a space where they feel safe to vent mm -hmm. and sometimes um, that venting can come at you. Um, and I've never had that venting be abusive. Um, I, you know, you hear horror stories that has never been my experience. But people get frustrated. Um, and I think it's important to have a bit of a skin if you're gonna do this um, and let it bounce off, right? And also know that it, it's got, like the dressing rooms are Vegas. Levi lives in Vegas. He's I'm sure uh, living this daily. What happens in the dressing room stays in the dressing room. And then you put it down and you walk away from it. Mm -hmm. But it's often, never personal. And That's people right. have an idea from old movies or from I, images about really how it is backstage. We're not their servants. We're not Ooh. in little black dresses with white collars saying, yes, ma'am. <laughs> um, we're colleagues and partners in the performing process. Mm -hmm. And that's uh, something that sometimes people don't really realize. Um, the, the performers don't treat us that way. And, uh, but it's a perception that some people have about how, what that relationship is like. Yeah, I think, you know, this gets formed by old, old movies like, um, oh, like The Dresser, right? Based on the, the Ronald Harwood play. I am not here to solve your marital problems. I am not here to go get you coffee. Now I'll go get a friend coffee if I'm grabbing myself something else. Um, um, I am here to do a job and I am a professional. Um, I feel like the, the atmosphere at the festival, it's one of the reasons I decided to keep working at the festival for as long as I did and um, continue to work at the festival is the, that, that atmosphere of professionalism is not only cultivated, but um, emphasized. Um, and so you, you know, you don't get into situations where someone is treating you like you're their mother or you're their mate, mm -hmm. um, because I am neither of those things. And that's definitely one thing the festival has done really, a really great job of cultivating that culture of respect between the performer and the technicians. Um, because being here in Vegas and working for a number of different entertainment companies, you see that culture isn't always the same. Um, and the festival does a fantastic job of creating this really, really supportive, respectful 
partnership between the technicians and the performers. There's a real culture of mentorship at the festival and it works yes. across boundaries of disciplines. Um, I, I have people I consider my intellectual mentors who are actors um, who goaded me into getting a PhD. Um, uh, but I've also seen uh, older actors me actively mentor younger actors, hmm. perhaps come into the situation um, thinking that they understand a hierarchy that doesn't actually exist, um, mm -hmm. right? There's not a hierarchy between actors and technicians. There are hierarchies within those um, disciplines. Um, and I've, I've certainly seen older actors, um, uh, as my grandfather would have said, take people aside and speak to them. Um, uh, uh, and that works. Um, and, and, uh, it, and I think we all deeply appreciate it, right? Because it means uh, things don't escalate. And it means we all get to have this really wonderful, positive, um, intimate relationship. Well, and you, Sarah and Levi, I've seen you each mentor young technicians and bring them along and help them become leaders and mentors themselves. And I love that I'm here with Sarah because Sarah's definitely like my mentor and someone I look up to. So it's kind of funny that we have like the generations of, you know, <laughs> professor leader, Dr. Sarah McCarroll, Mr. Harvison, you know, like it, it's a circle of life. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I hope we don't have to do Lion King in next year. Um, I, one of one of the great satisfactions that I have is in having watched people who I, I am um, very flattered to, to know consider me a mentor. Levi, you're one of them. Andrew Cowder is one of them. There's a long list of people who have gone off to graduate school and are actually much better technicians now than I will ever be. Um, uh, and to know that like on some small level, you're part of that springboard. Um, I find that highly satisfying and, and I'm deeply grateful to Jeff for cultivating that culture of mentorship and progression. We've got a question from the audience about boundaries and you were talking about that intimate relationship. I, when I talk to wardrobe crew to get them set up in the beginning, I talk about uh, a professionalism and it's kind of like a doctor's office kind of relationship. <laughs> Um, can you guys talk a little bit more about how those boundaries are set and how you maintain them and, and what happens if they kind of cross? Well, you set them up by approaching uh, the, the, the relationship from the jump, from the first dress rehearsal, if you're meeting an actor for the first time, by behaving professionally, mm -hmm. um, by introducing yourself um, as their dresser uh, and explaining, um, and sometimes it's, it's just about educating, particularly young actors, explaining what, the, what your relationship is gonna be. Here's what I'm here to do for you. Um, uh, I've only occasionally had problems with overstepping of boundaries um, and none of them have been egregious. And most of the time they can be handled um, if you have a relationship of trust by simply saying, hey, you know what, that felt like pushing it a little to me. Could you just not do that again? Um, I, have, I have once in my, you know, 30 years of working in theater by now, um, gone to a stage manager and said, we have a problem. Um, and that will definitely solve it, but you hate to go that far. Mm -hmm. do you, yeah. Go um, and uh, it, Jeff is completely right in that it's kind of like a doctor's office. Um, you're very, very respectful. The other thing I always like to do is I like to check in with the performer before the show. And I think I learned this from Dr. Sarah McCarroll of like how much touch they need during the change because some performers don't wanna to be touched at all. And some of them like really need that like physical cue. Like when you're done, you tap their back. Um, and uh, you always knock when you enter the room. Um, when you're doing changes backstage, there's usually a curtain in place that you know preserves the performer's modesty and it's just you and that performer there. Um, and then you always talk about stuff like, um, a little bit of self-deprecating humor on my part, I think has helped. Um, this doesn't work for every personality type. And that's one of the things that's important. Dressers have different personalities, different styles. Dr. McCarroll dr dresses very differently from me and we manage our teams very differently because of our age difference and our personalities and our uh, levels of education. Um, for me, I always approach things with a little bit of self-deprecating humor. And I'm like, okay, this is going to be awkward for me. Ha ha ha. And that kind of sets them at ease. And then they set that boundary of like, oh no, that's okay. You can, you know, tighten that corset that way or, you know, whatever you need to do to make the change function. Um, 
it's about constantly checking in with where the boundaries are set by the performer and making sure that you are comfortable and they are comfortable and there's constant communication. Yeah, communication. Do you think any of this has changed over the last 10 or 15 years? I know it has. Yeah. Um, and part of that has to do with the broader national conversation about just what acceptable behaviors are. Yeah. Um, uh, and I think it, particularly in the theater, is for the best because um, we are both friends and um, working professionals in very tight spaces with a lot of people in theater. And it, um, it is sometimes tricky to define what those lines are. I find that I make it a point not to talk about personal stuff in the theater, right? Like we can talk about that sitting on a porch uh, after I get back from laundry, but that's, that's not the part of me you have access to mm -hmm. in this moment. In this moment, I am a working professional and I, I have that priority. The one thing that I always kept in mind is sometimes the performers are having personal conversations while you're changing them. You never join those conversations. You are not part of those conversations while you're at work because they are talking to themselves. So you are not part of that. And that really helps set up that boundary of like, this is work, this is social. Yeah, stagehands wear black, so do wardrobe professionals. Um, and the point of that is that the eye reads black as nothingness. So it's easy for you to disappear. Um, and that's a pretty good lesson for people in wardrobe to learn is that um, unless a per performer invites you into the conversation, it's really best to sort of, because what your brain really ought to be thinking about is what your hands are doing and what your next chore is. Yeah, good, good. Um, can you talk a little bit about the idea of wardrobe being a whole career? Some people make their whole living doing wardrobe and it's satisfying. It's financially, can be financially rewarding and, um, and possible. Levi, why don't you take this to start with? Yeah. Um, yeah. Wardrobe can definitely, definitely be an entire career, especially in a town that's very entertainment focused. So um, Los Angeles, New York, Las Vegas, Chicago, um, and essentially you are working every night backstage uh, on whatever show you're assigned to and you're running a specific track, specific cues. And if you do everything right, everything should be the same every night. So for example, I was a wardrobe attendant on Michael Jackson one uh, by Cirque du Soleil at Mandalay Bay. And um, as a wardrobe attendant on that show, you learn every wardrobe track backstage, which is intense because there's nine of them. Uh, and there's 72 performers and you don't know which ones are gonna be in every day and you don't know what their personal preferences are on their changes or what tracks they have. So you would come in, you would check what they're doing every night. So for example, on um, one night performer A, B may be on track one, but the next night they may be on track two that may require different costumes. So you have to be very conscious of what's happening, what you're setting up. Um, but when you decide to work professionally in wardrobe, you uh, it's very, very financially lucrative, especially here in Vegas that pays very, very well. And you got casino insurance, which is good. Like we love that casino healthcare. Um, but uh, you are working every night for the shows. And when you're working the shows in Vegas, you're working two shows a night. It's a full eight hour shift. So you come in, um, depending on the show, you may or may not prep the costumes. Sometimes they have a day crew that does that. Um, but you set up the, sh the show, the, put the costumes where they need to be, and then you physically are moving around backstage to where the performers need you, depending on what track you're running that night. Um, it's incredibly challenging because it's incredibly rewarding. And even though theoretically it's the same every night, it's not because you're running a different track with different performers. Um, and of course you end up having tracks that are your favorite. So for example, if anyone's seen uh, Michael Jackson one by Cirque du Soleil, I loved running the moon track, which you were literally just up in the grid by yourself the whole night and you would get the girl that's singing in from the moon in and out of her costume so she could go to the bathroom between songs. And her costume was like 50 pounds of LEDs and she'd come and you'd like hoist her out of her harness and get her out of the dress and hold it while she took a whisper. And then um, got her, you know, back in, back harnessed, the rigger would check her and then we fly her back in. And your whole job was just getting her in and out every night. Um, and then of course, there's the other variation of that here in Vegas where you are a wardrobe costume technician where your day shift, your first four hours um, is building costumes, adjusting costumes, repairing costumes, and then you run the show and then you do laundry and then you go home. Um, and both of those are very, very rewarding options for people that wanna run wardrobe for life um, and love that excitement and that energy backstage. It's incredibly rewarding. When I was working for Chris Angel, it was, 
literally so much fun because he's such a character um and he's so charismatic and funny and then the stuff that happens backstage in a magic show my lips are sealed because nda but like it it's wild it's the wild west backstage and it's a different type of wild west than the shakespeare festival is because when you're working regional theater stuff happens you're never prepared for um which we'll we'll talk about uh but wardrobe is a very, very rewarding career that can be very financially lucrative. I hope that hit all the points. Yeah. Well, let me let me just on a side note. Uh, who was your boss at Cirque du Soleil? Uh, my boss was Randy Handley, uh, who is also was one of Jeff's students and worked for the festival for years and years and years, and someone I consider a personal mentor. Um, and he's now up at, he's at DePaul University. He was yes, never my DePaul. student officially, but uh, yeah. I was certainly his mentor. And he came to us as a young undergraduate and grew up at the festival and uh, then went to North Carolina Chapel Hill for his master's degree and uh, worked at Cirque for a number of years on tour, world tours, as well as Las Vegas. And then um, now is teaching at uh, DePaul University in Chicago. And that's another thing with the wardrobe industry is we are so tightly knit that like if you're like oh I went to UW Milwaukee everyone will know oh Jeff Leader taught you if you're like um I went to Chapel Hill they'll know exactly who worked there or uh of course you got Jackie um down at Alabama um and we all she's know each Florida other now. she's at Florida State now oh she's at Florida State now yeah, yeah. not keeping track I think that's another thing um that Jeff just touched on when he was talking about Randy to talk about in terms of um, what the possibilities of wardrobe as a career are. Um, mm -hmm. th there are actually lots of ways to make wardrobe your career. I had a student who spent a couple of years on tour working wardrobe and while you're young that's like if you can live out of a suitcase for a couple of years go do it. You can put a lot of money in the bank doing that. Not and get, for me. Wish I could get that money. Not for me. <laughs> work for everyone right but if you can hack it cool there's working wardrobe on cruise ships um it's mm -hmm. not just about relocating to a major city um that makes it easier if you want to be in one place um most regional theaters can't afford to keep their wardrobe technicians the people who just come in every night and run the changes on staff as full-time employees um I think part of the national conversation um, that's happening right now in theater is about how we um, find more ways to make more of the jobs in theater um, financially supportable in terms of a living wage. Um, uh, but you know, you can you can be a wardrobe person in Milwaukee, in Atlanta, in Chicago. You can be only a wardrobe person in New York, LA, Las Vegas. Um, I often say that if I had known that that world existed when I was 20 and finishing my bachelor's degree, I'd have moved to New York and my life would be completely different right now. Um, but that ship has long since sailed and I wasn't on it. Uh, uh, so, um, you know, it's not just, I have to move to New York to this huge city if you're interested in working wardrobe. There are other entry points into wardrobe as an industry. And the other nice thing um, I think that both Sarah and I need to mention um, is that uh, we've both moved into the world of education. Um, but one of the things we have to do at, or not but, but one of the things that is our responsibility as educators is to make sure people not only know that wardrobe could be a long-term career, but that you should have other costuming and theater skills outside of that to make yourself incredibly marketable and flexible because uh, Dr. McCarroll, you do a lot more than just wardrobe and I do a lot more than just wardrobe. We have other skills in costuming and we've both been hired for those skills in addition to wardrobe. So sometimes wardrobe's like the little bonus of like, oh, they've worked wardrobe. And sometimes it's like, oh, they can really sew. Cool, you know, so that helps you get a job. And one of the things with being a costumer in a professional setting is you really got to do it all. You got to be really well-rounded. And typically you got to do one thing that you're really good at. And you have to have a head on your shoulders and understand what it takes to make a play. Like Sarah was talking about mm -hmm. working with the performers and understanding the text. It's not just about a chore. Uh, or a factory job. It's about mm -hmm. being an intellectual partner mm -hmm. in the whole process. And that's that's an important thing. And having a calm and and sane demeanor uh, is critical. Mm -hmm. <laughs> in, well, in pretty much yeah. everything, everything. If you're insane, you know, go into politics. But we're all and, a little bit insane um, here, though. Uh, a little bit, a little bit. Um, so what, um, why don't we talk, we don't have any more questions yet. Why don't we talk about um, 
some some crazy things that happen. People always want to know about, they always ask me about, what do they call wardrobe malfunctions. God bless Janet Jackson, but we don't have those, right? But there are things that happen. Now, what are they and how did you solve them? Well, um, I'll start by telling a story on myself. Um, you know, what, as a wardrobe person, I like to, if I can make an actor's life easier, I will make an actor's life easier. So this, this is a number of years ago now, we're doing Othello at the Utah Shakespeare Festival and I'm dressing Justin Gordon who played Claudio. Um, and Justin and I had worked it out that I was gonna have the strawberry handkerchief, which is a major prop. It's sort of a plot point in my apron, right? And that I would give it to him before the scene where he walked on stage and Cassio has the handkerchief. And one night he didn't ask and I didn't hand it to him. And he got out there without this. And I have no idea how he solved it. Don't know, don't have a clue. Um, but he came off stage um, and was like, Sarah, Sarah, we forgot the hanky. And I put my hand into my wardrobe apron and went, oh no. I was pretty sure there was a note in the rehearsal report about that one. Um, Levi, what have you got? Our goal, our wardrobe's goal is to keep out of the notes. Stage manager yeah. <laughs> notes every night about every department and everything that went, sometimes went well and everything that went wrong. And, and my goal is for wardrobe to stay out of the notes, to never be mentioned. When Dr. McCarroll and I were both uh, the summers that we were both in charge, it was always like a point of pride when you get that email in the morning and you're like, wardrobe did nothing wrong. You know, like <laughs> we loved it. Um, I, we've had a couple crazy things. I haven't had anything too crazy happen at the festival because the festival is a pretty well-oiled machine. Um, I'm sure there's stuff that happened while I was in the Adams because the Adams was a space. That that place is an adventure. I love it, but whew, running a show back there, you never knew. Uh, the Randall's pretty stable. Um, backstage, there's, it's, it's just a really, really well-built theater. There's easy access if there's an emergency you can typically run not run but safely go down those stairs down to the dressing rooms get what you need um i think the craziest thing i've hap had happen was actually at skylight opera in milwaukee we were working the wizard of oz and this wizard of oz production was like cursed like anything that could go wrong would go wrong on it it had a turntable for the tornado i'm sure jeff you remember it it was it was a wild show but we had two different totos one was white and its name was snowy and the other one was brown and its name was hilly and they would do reverse nights just like the kids in the show and snowy was a monster um <laughs> snowy was probably the meanest dog i've ever met and one of our jobs would be to like hand off snowy to um dorothy in one of the scenes and one of the nights i was handing him off and he was like clearly not too happy and i was like sorry and um uh dorothy was um Oh no, she hasn't been at the festival, it's Susie, but uh, she's been in a lot of stuff. She's been in some national advertisements, but uh, handed off Snowy, Dorothy goes out, starts to sing Somewhere Over the Rainbow and Snowy just latches onto her arm, just like takes a chunk out of her arm. And Susie's a champ, she's singing over it, like just somewhere, you know, like the rainbow as this dog is latched onto her arm. We get her off stage, she's bleeding. I grab Snowy. Snowy immediately poops because that was the problem. Um, and then we are running through the theater to get the understudy costume for Dorothy to get the understudy on because Susie is bleeding from her arm because this dog bit her. Um, Snowy was fired. Um, <laughs> but as it turns out, we were very lucky because that was a quick change anyway, where she would be changing from the, the gray dress into the blue plaid dress, gingham dress that would go on once she's in Oz. So the timing couldn't have been better. Uh, but that was kind of crazy because we're like trying to handle getting the dress off without getting blood on it. And it, there are always blood adventures in theater. It's not a real show unless someone bleeds a little bit. Um, and we do take, we do yes. work on, you know, safety procedures for yep. blood pathogens. Yes, yes, we definitely have the OSHA training. Carefully monitor, yeah, OSHA training. Um, but there's always there's always something that happens. Someone will get snagged on something or a paper cut or, you know, Lord knows what. So we do a lot of stuff that fixes those problems. I think that's the craziest thing that I've had happen. Um, a non-wardrobe happening at the Shakespeare Festival I had was that summer we were doing midwives uh, or Mary, midwives, Mary Wives of Windsor. We called it midwives. Mary Wives of Windsor uh, in the Adams. 
and uh, it started raining and something on the campus wasn't set up right. So the water started draining into the basement of the Adams. Oh, yeah. oh, and there, and, there was a King John night where that happened too, where there was yeah. at least eight inches of standing water yes. at the top of the tunnel up and, against an electrical box. Yes, and it was coming in through that electrical box. And yeah. so like we had to go over to the, the Randall and go through the uh, costume boxes and we got the rubber boots so that we could like wade through the water to grab the costumes off the rack that we put under the stairs. Um, and that was one of the, just like the joys and challenges of working in that place. It's, it's a crazy story, uh, which is a great reason why we have a new theater that doesn't flood occasionally. Um, but also I wouldn't trade my experience in the Adams for the world because no, I love that game. building is truly just a magical place. Um, but yeah, getting the performers upstage, upstairs, getting the costumes changed, figuring out where the stuff has to go. You know, you really like uh, Jeff said and Dr. McCarroll said, you really have to keep a very stable, calm head, especially when you're in charge of that situation. Because the performers, I will tell you this, God love them. They will, in that situation, they do not stay calm. Uh, no. Um, I think, uh, so I've got a blood story because um, <laughs> we've all got blood stories. Uh, my blood story is that in the afternoon that Tybalt didn't duck low enough during the fight with Mercutio at the end of part one of Romeo and Juliet and took a rapier right here. Um, and it, you know, it wasn't a deep wound, but head wounds bleed like crazy. Um, so, God, this was like maybe my second or third year. This was a long time ago. So we're talking about like maybe 2005. Um, uh, uh, poor Ben Rigel had to come off stage and get stitched up. Um, and then we had to get blood out of his quilted velvet doublet. Um, fortunately, Tybalt's dead, so he doesn't have to come back on stage. You can just send him home. Um, I think the craziest thing was the year of King Lear and Twelfth Night, um, when, so um, at the festival, well, we do a full slate of understudy costumes. We know what's going to happen to the costumes if anyone for any reason isn't in a show. Um, it's an entire binder of paperwork. Levi and I have both over the years spearheaded that adventure. Um, but that doesn't happen until we get the shows up. Our focus until the shows go up is on getting the shows up, which is all well and good until during your final dress rehearsals, um, the woman playing Regan, Goneril, I don't know, they're the same in my head, um, had a family emergency and had to leave. Well, she's in King Lear, but she's also playing Olivia in Twelfth Night. So one understudy went in for one of those roles and another understudy went in for another. Great, now we're fitting both of those understudies. The poor young woman who went in as Olivia got a stomach bug um, and was literally walking off stage to vomit during the final dress rehearsal. Um, that, that was an adventure I'm happy to not repeat um, in terms of very quick and dirty alterations to, uh, that we're never going to tell Jeff about um, to get garments onto bodies. Um, and then just trying to shepherd someone who's in an incredibly stressful situation and feeling really awful through a performance. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and, you know, at that point, um, sometimes you're making decisions that have to do with triage, but you need that triage to be about the best possible product and the most humane treatment of people you can possibly manage. And that's one thing we do deal with a lot um, is when performers don't feel well and they, they feel so responsible that they're like, I have to go on, I have to go on, the show will not go on without me. And it's like, honey, you got an understudy, we got this taken care of. Um, but sometimes they're just too bullheaded and they'll, they'll force themselves out there and then you're there for when they don't feel well and it, it happens. They will force themselves through the show if they have to. Um, but like Sarah said, we are totally prepared for that situation unless the door handle breaks off in the theater and you can't get to the understudy costumes, which happened my last summer at the Randall and we needed the understudy costumes in the door, the room that they were in, the door handle broke off of and we had the um, campus security come and literally like jack open the door. It was wild. Or it was like so uh, much is... noises off backstage. Yeah, oh it, it literally was. Sometimes so much is happening that like no matter how good you are, um, and I, this is another story on myself. So it's My Fair Lady, 
Um, Kurt, uh, no, uh, Richard Kinter had um, some health problems. So our Colonel Pickering um, was already out of the show. Um, so we had an understudy in, fine. Um, and then the actor playing Higgins got laryngitis. So now we have an understudy in for Higgins. And at the festival, um, we do tiered understudies. So if one person goes out, multiple things can happen below them as people move up in roles. Um, and God love um, poor Aaron Galligan Sterl, who walked off stage one night um, at, to change from the Ascot races to Colonel Boxington. And it wasn't my track had changed so much that I looked at him and I said, Aaron, keep going. I forgot your pants. Um, and I don't think I've ever gotten to the Randall dressing rooms faster. Yeah. Don't forget Aaron's another good one to work with. He's those who are watching, don't forget, you can ask questions, type them in and they'll be passed on to us. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to ask. Um, uh, we talk about blood. We use stage blood too. Uh, have, uh, stage blood is a whole nother aspect of wardrobe. We have to make sure it's contained and controlled and looks perfect every night. Um, have you had any experiences with that that you want to talk about? Um, when we did Amadeus, this would have been 2014, 15, 15, 2015. Um, David Ivers, you know, cuts his throat at the end of the show. Um, he was playing Salieri. Uh, and we just had all the problems with blood that whole summer. It wouldn't work or it would work too much. And like, sometimes it would like really spray and sometimes it would dribble. Um, and uh, that was one of those ones that we constantly tinkered with. The other problem too is the mixture that we ended up using did end up staining that uh, cravat really badly. And no matter how much we washed it, we just couldn't get it out. It was just the specific type of mixture that the director wanted for the consistency they wanted for the blood spray. And um, the solution to that was building multiple cravats that we would then rotate out as needed. And I think we ended up going through like 10 or 12 throughout the whole summer. Um, but after every show, there would be one person who was actually, uh, I believe it was Kehlani Gleave, uh, who would just sit there just scrubbing <laughs> that cravat as best as possible um, and really, really trying. I think that's the only show that I worked on with real blood because when we did Titus, we didn't, we used visual textile blood. We didn't use real blood. I think that's the only one I've worked on at the festival that had yeah, for, uh, I spent fake blood. Years and years in the Adams. So there were a lot of history plays with battles. Um, so I've worked with a lot of blood. I just don't remember specifics because there's been so much. Um, one of the things we do is we make sure all the blood, the stuff that's got blood on it stays separate. We have separate mm -hmm. laundry baskets. The laundry baskets get wiped down after you take the clothes out so that you're not transferring things where you don't have to. Um, wardrobe people don't love blood shows um, because we know it means we're going to be there later um, because you have to deal with the blood laundry separately. Um, but if that's part of the job, that's part of the job and you suck it up and you get it done. Um, a good mixture, as Levi says, can, can help. Also, the use of non-natural fibers. Polyester is your friend under those circumstances. Um, uh, sorry, I just lost my train of thought. I think I'm well, done. Silk, silk and cotton have a strong affinity. The dye has a strong affinity for those fibers. And yeah. so we test things ahead of time to make mm -hmm. sure that we don't end up foretelling the process with pink costumes uh, yeah. halfway through the run. We and we are so lucky at the festival too to have Gail as our painter and dyer because she does an incredible job of making the different types of blood and the samples that would be needed as well as the prop department, you know, depending on whose okay. job it actually ends up on the show. And I think that's worth mentioning that, that actually as little blood that you see on stage as possible is actual real liquid, right? We could do a lot with mm -hmm paints and dyes that are permanently set into costumes so that we don't have to wash it out and recreate it every night. Um, sometimes you can't avoid that. Sometimes, um, as with the, the Salieri bit, you need to see the blood start to happen on stage. Mm -hmm. um, but we really try to avoid it because it's not repeatable, right? And one of the things that we're trying to do in all of theater, really, is to create a repeatable experience mm -hmm. um, that is uh, knowable so that we know what effect we can have for the audience every time we do it. Um, uh, I will say sometimes it's not blood. My first summer working at the festival, it's another David Ivers anecdote. Um, he was uh, playing Truffaldino in The Servant of Two Masters and at the end of the first act took a Boston cream pie to the face, um, uh, which was fine in terms of his shirt. We just had a second clean shirt and it was fine in terms of David. We just gave him a washcloth and let him mop himself down. Um, it was a lot trickier in terms of his leather vest. Um, I remember going 
coming to Jeff as a baby, baby wardrobe person and saying, I'm cleaning this every night because I have to wash it down and it's really upsetting the leather because I'm su like, I'm sucking the moisture out of the leather. And Jeff said, here's leather conditioner, have fun. Um, and, and it worked, right? It, we got it through the summer, but it was an adventure. And actually one, one other substance we've worked with that wasn't blood that, um, uh, oh, what was it? Uh, when we were doing um, Charlie's aunt or where's uh, Charlie's aunt at the festival, not where's Charlie. Um, they eat those little mayo sandwiches at one point in the play. And one night um, it was Betsy McGarrow took a bite of it and like squirted out onto her skirt. And we all just were like, oh, it's mayo. This is how we'll get it out. It wasn't mayo, which we didn't know. And then we set the stain into the dress because it wasn't mayo. It was actually like dairy based whipped cream. I can't remember what it was, but we followed the protocols for removing mayo from it and it wasn't mayo. And uh, how we ended up fixing that is Jeff came in and put more flowers on that part of the dress, <laughs> um, which you know sometimes happens. Uh, but that's another thing that's really important to read those run notes and those uh, different notes because that was on me. That was something that I missed that note in the production notes at some point that like, oh, it's not a real mayo sandwich because Betsy is allergic to mayo. It's whipped cream. And because of that, a mistake was made that stained the garment. So it's really important that we pay attention to those notes. And one of the things that I am really insist upon is that the show maintain, we maintain the show all the way through the run. I want the closing mm -hmm. night audience to see the same show that happened on opening night. And it's our responsibility to make sure those clothes stay mm -hmm. the way they were on opening. Sometimes they're fil they look like they're filthy dirty through Gail Wolfen and Steve's painting and dying. And even they, they have to be maintained as filthy dirty rags even though they're clean on the inside or they're beautiful silk dresses that have to stay the same and it's important that our closing night audiences get the same performance as the opening night audience and, and that's always an adventure too is maintaining those distressed clothes throughout the run and making sure they look just the right amount of dirty because sometimes you still have to clean them but they still have to look dirty and then we send them back and forth and that's another part of the process is you know, keeping that artistic integrity and the vision of the director in place. Well, there might be some high school students or young college students who are watching this or going to watch it later. Do you guys have any advice for them in uh, formulating a career in the theater, whether it's in wardrobe or any other thing? How about what's kind of standard backstage procedure advice that you might want to give a, a young performer or a young technician? Um. So I think the most important thing is to learn now the lesson that everyone's contribution to the communal effort has the same value. Um, you are not the bottom rung of the totem pole because you work wardrobe. Um, uh, likewise, young actors should learn that technicians are worthy of their respect because uh, while they don't get the applause or their pictures in the programs, um, they have a very specialized set of skills that help you do your job better. Um, I think that that uh, cross-disciplinary empathy and respect is the key to a successful theatrical production, frankly. Um, and I think the key bouncing off of that um, is definitely, you need to do a little bit of everything. So especially when you're in college and most college programs do a very, very good job of this now, but you need to take a couple acting classes. You need to take some lighting classes. You need to take, uh, you know, stagecraft and directing and costuming and even take some classes that are outside theater that will help you understand theater. History classes are incredibly important because if you don't understand history, how are you going to work on a show and be intellectually engaged with these performers like Dr. McCarroll said. Um, so a multidisciplinary approach to theater is really the key to long term success. Um, because Jeff is a great example of this. You can kind of do a little bit of everything. I, I mean, I haven't seen you perform, but I think if it really came down to it, we could see some really intense King Lear out of you. Oh, God. <laughs> And I think in terms of specific skills, um, if you're interested in wardrobe, um, start thinking about how you can develop your sewing skills, even if you're a high school student, right? Um, uh, and and um, know that you are not circumscribed in that through the miracle of modern technology by where you are. I come from a very, very small Southern town. There was no theater program in my high school, um, but I started learning how to sew. I started learning how to sew from my, my mother and my grandmother. And now we have the miracle of YouTube, right? Which will show you how to do anything. Um, 
Um, because even the ability to just run a hand stitch, just a straight stitch, can help you backstage in an emergency. Um, and if you want to start working wardrobe professionally, it is not immediately necessary that you be able to do the emergency zipper repair. There is always going to be someone on the crew like Levi or like me who can deal with something that really blows up in your face. But if you can cleanly apply a snap or a button or um, a hook and bar, um, you become very valuable at that point. <laughs> And that's one of the things too, is when we're running wardrobe shows, there's definitely when we're assigning our teams and Jeff is looking at who is going to work in what theater, we're very careful about where we assign people based on their skill sets, because I will say it, I'm not the world's strongest stitcher. If I have to put in a zipper, it's going to take me a second. It's not my favorite thing to do, but you have Shelby uh, who teaches at um, SUU and US and she's worked at the festival. Um, she can set a zipper in like two seconds. Kehlani, boom. Every summer, I begged Jeff to give me Kehlani in my theater because she can literally do anything in two seconds. And it might be the dirtiest repair in the world, but from 30 feet away, you wouldn't know. And then afterwards, she'll fix it perfectly. And that's part of being in wardrobe is knowing what who's on your team, what their skill sets are, what their strengths are, and how to best manage them. Yeah, whatever situations you can put yourselves in um, as young theater professionals that force you into problem solving. Um, say yes to opportunities, um, because whether or not those opportunities lead you in the ultimate direction of your career path, they're going to ask you to solve problems. And that's a transferable skill set, no matter what you end up doing. Um, and as I have said earlier, the thing you have to be able to do um, in theater anywhere, but in wardrobe um, in particular, since we're talking about it, is think on your feet. Um, because no matter how well you plan, something will go wrong because it's live theater. Um, and that means you need to be able to make a good decision quickly. I often tell my students, um, if it's a good decision that will get you through the night, we can talk later about how you might have made the decision better. But what I don't want is stasis. I don't want you to get so worried about being wrong that you won't make a choice. Um, so, and sometimes your choice will blow up on you and people will get onto you. But I think learning to have that agency of making choices is ultimately more important. And that skill set is something that'll benefit you no matter what career you go into, because there are so many people that do theater for a little bit and then leave and then come back. And especially in a town like Vegas, you know, the theater skill set can get you into any career. So that flexibility and that ability to think on your feet is really, really valuable. I have juniors and seniors right now flipping their lids and I understand their anxiety because at the moment they are preparing themselves to get degrees in an industry that is shut down. Um, and what I tell them is that the skills we train you for in theater are skills that will allow you to work anywhere. Um, you regularly see interviews with people in the corporate world who say, we can teach you how to run our computer system. What we can't teach you to do is interact well with a group of people, uh, work collaboratively, think on your feet and problem solve. Theater won't let you get away from those skills. Theater will insist that you develop those skills. Um, so uh, what I keep saying to my students right now is you're going to be employable. It may not be the, the, the employment you thought it was going to look like, but you're going to be employable. Good, good, good advice, good advice. Well, I want to thank you both for spending time with us today and, and uh, giving us a little insight into wardrobe and backstage life that sometimes people don't have. Well, we don't really want people to think about it. When they're sitting out front watching the show, we don't want, us, want them to think about what we're doing back there. But it is nice to get a little insight. And I think that's one of the best aspects of the festival is that we open those doors and windows so that people can see and appreciate a little more deeply. But I don't want anybody who's watching to think about how that fast changed worked or what's going on backstage while they're concentrating on the play on stage. Uh, it's just meant to support it all. Um, our sponsors were uh, Cedar City and Bryan Head Tourism Council and uh, we thank them very much for the support of these virtual seminars. Uh, Michael, do you have any closing remarks? Yeah, I'm, I just want to really, really thank Dr. Sarah McCara and Levi uh, uh, Harbison for coming on. I'm so grateful. Uh, what I've really enjoyed about this hour, and I know our patrons are feeling the same way, is the way you have celebrated all of the 
all of the professionals that you have worked with. I love the way you talk about all of those great actors and other technicians, both those technicians that you've learned with and those that you have worked side by side as a peer in those dressing rooms. And uh, it really is a really wonderful collaborative art. And part of the goal of our virtual seminars here is to celebrate and elevate the industry, uh, the many, many different tasks that we have here. So thank you so much uh, for being a part of that and for celebrating us, uh, celebrating all of those other individuals, people who we miss and who we'll all see again this, this summer as everything comes back together and we get back online. I do want to share, um, any, any last comments, uh, Sarah? Okay. We're, we're planning a huge 2021 season and I want everybody to come back and sit in the theater, in the outdoor theater, the indoor theater and, uh, and see the work. I think uh, we're gearing up and the world is changing enough that we're gonna have a wonderful 2021. Absolutely. This 2020, oh man. Yeah, uh, the energy, and I said this before the conversation started, I said, oh, this is gonna be a great one uh, because I love the passion that both of you share uh, for that intimate art of wardrobe. Uh, I mean, it's a very, very intimate, highly skilled art. And uh, uh, I'd like to encourage anybody who's interested uh, in that to continue your education down that path. Uh, I'm very excited about next week. We're gonna learn about musical directors and musical direction. You know, you hear about directors and you hear about, you know, musical, but what is a musical director? And we've got some really, really great um, musical directors who have worked for the festival over the years. We're gonna be joined by uh, Brad Carroll and Jeremy uh, man who will be uh, joining us. We're going to be talking about musical theater. So join us next week. You can find all of these conversations that we've had for the whole year on our website. Go to bard.org, go to the bottom of the page, and you'll find virtual festival. And there you'll find all of our virtual offer, uh, op offerings. You can also find this on our YouTube channel which you can subscribe to. And we'll also have this up on Facebook, which you can share as well. Thank you so much. We are grateful that you're here and uh, we will see you in our virtual grove.